gentlemen, in a few minutes you are to deal your blow, but in receiving your verdict I shall at least have the satisfaction of having injured the existing society, this cursed society in which one may see a single man uselessly spending enough to feed thousands of families, an infamous society that permits a few individuals to monopolize all social wealth while there are hundreds of thousands of unfortunates who have not even the bread that is not refused to dogs, and while entire families are committing suicide for want of the necessities of life. Ah, gentlemen, if the governing classes could go down among the unfortunates. But no, they prefer to remain deaf to their appeals. It seems that a fatality impels them, like the royalty of the 18th century, toward the precipice that will engulf them. For woe on those who remain deaf to the cries of the starving, woe on those who, believing themselves of superior essence, assume the right to exploit those beneath them. There comes a time when the people no longer reason, they rise like a hurricane, and pass away like a torrent. Then we see bleeding heads impaled on pikes. Among the exploited, gentlemen, there are two classes of individuals. Those of one class, not realizing what they are and what they might be take life as it comes, believe that they are born to be slaves, and content themselves with the little that is given them in exchange for their labor. But there are others, on the contrary, who think, who study, and who, looking about them, discover social iniquities. Is it their fault if they see clearly and suffer as seeing others suffer? Then they throw themselves into the struggle, and make themselves the bearers of the popular claims. Gentlemen, I am one of the latter. Wherever I have gone, I have seen unfortunate spent beneath the yoke of capital. Everywhere I have seen the same wounds causing tears of blood to flow, even in the remoter parts of the inhabited districts of South America, where I had the right to believe that he who was weary of the pains of civilization might rest in the shade of the palm trees and there study nature. Well, there even, more than elsewhere, I have seen capital come, like a vampire, to suck the last drop of blood of the unfortunate pariahs. Then I came back to France, where I was forced to see my family suffer atrociously. This was the last drop in the cup of my sorrow. Tired of leading this life of suffering and cowardice, I carried this bomb to those who are primarily responsible for social misery. I am reproached with the wounds of those who were struck by my projectiles. Permit me to point out in passing that, if the bourgeois had not massacred or caused massacres during the revolution, it is probable that they would still be under the yoke of the nobility. On the other hand, figure up the dead and wounded in Tonkin, Madagascar, Dahomey, adding to this the thousands, yes, millions of unfortunates who die in the factories, the mines, and wherever the grinding power of capital is felt. Add also those who die of hunger and all this with the assent of our deputies. Beside all this, of how little weight are the reproaches now brought against me. It is true that one does not efface the other, but, after all, are we not acting on the defensive when we respond to the blows that we receive from above? I know very well that I shall be told that I ought to have confined myself to speech for the vindication of the people's claims. But what can you expect? It takes a loud voice to make the deaf hear. Too long have they answered our voices by imprisonment, the rope, and rifle volleys. Make no mistake, the explosion of my bomb is not only the cry of a rebel valent, but the cry of an entire class that vindicates its rights, and that will soon add acts to words. For, be sure of it, in vain will they pass laws. The ideas of the thinkers will not halt. Just as, in the last century, all the governmental forces could not prevent the Diderots and the Voltaires from spreading emancipating ideas among the people, so all the existing governmental forces will not prevent the Reckless, the Darwins, the Spencers, the Bsons, the Merbus from spreading the ideas of justice and liberty that will annihilate the prejudices that hold the mass in ignorance. And these ideas, welcomed by the unfortunate, will flower in acts of revolt as they have done in me until the day when the disappearance of authority shall permit all men to organize freely according to their choice, when everyone shall be able to enjoy the product of his labor, and when those moral maladies called prejudices shall vanish, permitting human beings to live in harmony, having no other desire than to study the sciences and love their fellows. I conclude, gentlemen, by saying that a society in which one sees such social inequalities as we see all about us, 
in which we every day see suicides caused by poverty, prostitution flaring at every street corner, a society whose principal monuments are barracks and prisons, such a society must be transformed as soon as possible, on pain of being eliminated, and as speedily, from the human race. Hail to him who labors, by no matter what means for this transformation. It is this idea that has guided me in my duel with authority, but as in this duel I have only wounded my adversary, it is now its turn to strike me. Now, gentlemen, to me it matters little what penalty you may inflict, for, looking at this assembly with the eyes of reason, I cannot help smiling to see you, Adams lost in matter, and reasoning only because you possess a prolongation of the spinal marrow, assume the right to judge one of your fellows. Ah! Gentlemen, how small a thing is your assembly and your verdict in the history of humanity, and human history, in its turn, is likewise a very little thing in the whirlwind that bears it through immensity, and that is destined to disappear, or at least to be transformed, in order to begin again the same history and the same facts, a veritably perpetual play of cosmic forces renewing and transferring themselves forever. 